Hello and welcome to our sustainability series program. Today, we're pleased to present David Craig, co-chair of the task force on nature related financial disclosures. As a global financial services provider, Mizuo takes seriously our responsibility to contribute positively to society and mitigate potential negative impacts. Sustainability and in particular climate risk is a significant imperative to our firm, clients and employees. With expectations of business today higher than ever, I'm proud that Mizuo strives to deploy its capital and other resources responsibly and that we're working to anticipate, mitigate and drive innovative solutions. We're seeing an increasing global focus on the more acute effects of nature related risk and biodiversity loss. The World Economic Forum estimates 44 trillion of economic value generation that's over half of the world's total GDP that is moderately or highly dependent on nature. Our guest today is at the front of efforts to develop and deliver a framework for organizations to report and act on rapidly escalating nature related risks. In order to enable the shift in global financial flow away from nature negative outcomes to nature positive outcomes, investors are seeking ways to evaluate opportunities. We're fortunate to have David Craig here with us today to discuss this very important topic. David is a senior advisor to London Stock Exchange Group and founder and former CEO of Refinitiv, one of the world's largest providers of data, analytics, and technology to financial markets. He was previously a partner at McKinsey and group head of strategy for Reuters. David is on the World Economic Forum Banking Governor Board and Digital Disruption and Innovation Group. He also co-chairs the India-UK Financial Services Partnership, the UK HMT, and the Indian Ministry of Finance. I now turn it over to Mark Wheatcroft, Head of Sustainability for Mizuho in the EMEA region, who will serve as today's moderator. Over to you, Mark. Nihal, thank you very much indeed for those opening remarks and introductions. David, good to spend some time with you. Um, but before we get into the work specifically of the TNFD and, and what, you, what you've been doing, I think it'd be good for the audience to, to set the scene and simply by defining biodiversity and nature um, I'm sure many of many of the audience will understand the impact to society, but perhaps if you can guide us as to the impact or potential impacts and importance with regards to financial markets. Well, it's very nice to see you again, Mark, and thank you for inviting me to talk to everyone today. Um, yes, yeah, so how do we find nature and biodiversity in the context of financial markets? Uh, it's the really important question. It's the crux of really what we're trying to do at the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. Um, and what it really means is that many companies, and arguably nearly all companies, are dependent in some way or another on nature, uh, the natural system, um, be it farming, producing of crops, or mineral extraction that's using the ground and extracting resources, or even things as diverse as um, manufacture of silicon chips uses water. We're all dependent in some form or another on nature and, and what we call ecosystem services. You know, water being a good example, it's a, a service that is provided to us from the natural system. Um, so we have these dependencies on nature for our business and we also create impact to the natural system. We might be um, polluting those natural systems. We might be using fertilizer, uh, we might be removing land that is supporting species and biodiversity. Now, the problem at the moment in our financial system and the way we value things is that these ecosystem services, these dependencies that we have, and the impacts that we might be making are not priced in. Um, and the problem with not pricing them in and, and effectively having a zero price is that we're relying on those dependencies and they're being used up and we're having more impact on nature than nature can sustain and we're creating risk to the system because ultimately the natural system will no longer support the commercial activities that, that we are having. And, and I'd put climate into the same bucket of the natural system. Atmospheric pollution is part of the natural system. So what the task force is ultimately trying to do is price in both the, the risk but the opportunity and also the opportunities of transition and change in the way that we're using natural resources and also regenerating them, not just exploiting them, 
um, or creating impacts that can't be sustained. And, and so that's really the definition of nature and biodiversity in the context of financial institutions and investors. I saw an interesting uh, quote from you recently. You were talking about the amount of money the US was spending on moving the bee population around the country to help with pollination. So I didn't realize that, that there was quite a scale of investment needed for something along those lines. And I think that really brings attention to the importance around nature. Um, you touched on it a little bit there. We've we've obviously focused a lot within financial institutions and certainly in Mizuho with regards to climate related risk, physical and, and transitional risk. We were the first Japanese mega bank to report under the task force for climate related financial disclosure or the TCFD. Talk a little bit about the differences between nature's risks and climate risks, if you would. Nature and climate, uh, I, as I mentioned um, earlier, are really integrated. They're two sides of the same coin. Um, and I'll talk a bit later about how we're building on the work of the TCFD and aligning very much to that methodology, uh, but also ensuring that we're including the, the very important specific um, issues around nature and biodiversity that you, you need to do. But they are two sides of the same coin. Um, in fact, what we see at the moment is much of the climate change and the increase in temperature and the adverse weather that we're seeing with floods and storms. You know, the largest impact is is not just um, you know to real estate and flooding, but it's to agriculture, it's to food production, um, and the natural system. Um, and so, the very um, the biggest issue that we have with climate change is actually the impact on the natural system and therefore our dependencies. Uh, and of course, we rely on the natural system to absorb much of the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse equivalent gases that we're producing. So as we degrade it faster, um, we depend on it more, and, and yet we're into this then vicious cycle between the two. So you have to look at these two things together. Um, and then, of course, you add into the fact that with many companies, including Japanese companies, um, but across the world, committing to net zero targets, um, and with artificial and mechanical sequestration of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases, very inefficient, relatively subscale, expensive at the moment. Natural-based solutions are going to be part of the solution for those offsets. And, and their climate and nature will come together very quickly in the financial market because you have to ensure that those natural-based solutions for absorbing carbon dioxide don't degrade nature and the natural system even more. For example, planting a singular forest isn't necessarily very good for biodiversity. Much better to plant a natural type of forest with multiple areas or even to preserve the forest in the first place. So um, one thing we've been urging and encouraging people to do is to think about climate and nature together. Um, we've been, as I said, um, trying to align the frameworks of TCFD and TNFD so that they can work together. And ultimately, they would probably be integrated. But I think we're some time away from that at the moment. Thank you. So let's dig into the TNFD a little bit more. Um, tell us about the journey that you've been on together with the uh, with the organization, your membership, and how that's coming about. And I understand that we should see that first version of a framework um, later this month. Yeah, no, thank you. So, I mean, I first got involved um, back in June last year. Um, I was very lucky that, in fact, 18 months of, being work, of work had been completed in what was called the Informal Working Group, a collection of about 80 companies, governments, NGOs, including some of the biggest financial institutions from around the world, had, had worked on really scoping out what is it the TNFD, the task force, would try and achieve. <clears throat> um, we were very fortunate that we got a G7 endorsement um, back in June last year, very important for us, and then actually a, a G20 endorsement um, in October. So we've got very, very strong government support and backing and, and financial backing, um, but we are market-led. We, we have a membership of now over 300 members um, across the world in, in a forum. Um, we've been very deliberate in selecting both financial institutions, asset owners, asset managers, uh, banks and lenders, um, as well as corporations, the, the fishing companies, the mineral companies, the agricultural companies, the production firms, to be in that membership group. So we have both, if you like, the, the reporters and, and the users of this data. Um, and we have very, very strong network of NGOs, science-based groups. I could list many of them that are involved in this. We, we are leveraging a lot of the work that's already been done by many of the, the groups um, already that have been out there and really pulling that together. 
Um, the task force is now 34 members. Um, this is where the hard work is done. These are these are real firms and individuals that are putting real work in, into this. Um, it's very representative as well of the north and the south um, of industries and financial institutions. It's about 18 trillion of assets under management. So it's got substantial asset owners, asset managers, the pension funds, um, the Norwegian pension fund, BlackRock, just to name a few banks like BMPP, HSBC, um, Benorte from um, um, uh, Latin America, uh, really, really strong representation and, and different views to really form a design. We are re releasing that first version um, this month. Uh, I would call it a prototype. It's it's certainly not the end result. It's the start. Uh, but it's a risk management and opportunities framework and a disclosure framework um, to test into the market to get feedback and input so that we can incorporate that into subsequent releases there will be several of those this year before we go into a production release, probably around middle of next year when we've got a lot of that feedback. We're taking a very open innovation approach. We recognize that a lot of input is required from many, many different stakeholders, including civil society and, um, and local indigenous groups as well, um, to ensure that we've got something designed by the market that takes a very complex problem of nature and biodiversity, tries to simplify it as much as we can, align to the TSFD, and then ultimately will be incorporated by the standards and reporting bodies um, as well. I guess a number of companies are getting used to measuring greenhouse gas emissions or the intensity thereof, um, the, the water that they're using and, and how they can recycle that and be better around waste. How do you go about measuring natural risks or I think within the principles, there is a science-based approach. How are you tackling that? It's a great question. Um, well, one thing you realize when you look at natural-based risk and biodiversity is you have to be very local. Um, the first thing a firm needs to do is really have a very good understanding of exactly where its operations are, both the operations it owns, but also the operations of its suppliers, what we call direct and, and upstream. Um, and also understand where they are, but what also is the ecosystem that those locations are in and what are some of the services that they are dependent on, um, the risks that that might give them and the dependencies they have. You, you mentioned bees and pollination in North America, but if you're one of the large almond farms in California, um, you need to know where your farms are. You need to know the dependencies you have on, say, water, on land fertility and pollination um, and understand the risks that are there. And, and companies are on different um, uh, they're on very different stages of this journey. Um, several of our members have spent three or four years building databases where they have an exact um, longitude, latitude, location analysis of every single part of their operations and many of their suppliers, and they've mapped the biomes, as we call them, those areas of natural sensitivity around it. Other companies, I was talking to a... Um, uh, a, a oil and gas company that's one of our on our groups um, uh, are much earlier on that journey and need to start doing a lot more work in that area. So there's quite a big difference between um, some of the fundamentals of how you approach climate versus um, natural risk and biodiversity. There's also some similarities. You mentioned water use. There are some metrics that are common across every area. But when it comes to specific targets and goals, um, you do have to get quite local. Uh, what you actually discover is that the, the targets, the goals, the constraints that you work in are actually set by local jurisdictions in the land area that you're in. And we work and rely heavily on groups like the, the CBD, the Convention for Biodiversity at the UN, that is in the process of meeting and setting those targets as well. So there are some commonalities between climate and nature, but with nature, you have to get a lot more local. Um, a lot more specificity and data is required about the local ecosystem in which you're operating. There's been some work done, I think, by a couple of the central banks as part of the network for greening the financial system. Um, I think the Dutch central bank were the first, followed by Brazil, and I understand France are all are, are looking at measuring that overall impact of their economies. Can you make comment on that at all? Have you been involved in um, sort of observing or, or part of those conversations? Uh, we have actually, and we, um, when it comes to scenario analysis, we obviously look at what they've done and, and are trying to align. Um, there's the N NGFS, the Network for Green and the Financial System, the collection of central banks, um, now chaired by Ravi Menon from MAS in Singapore. And um, what we see is that gradually more and more central banks will start doing what the Dutch, as you said, pioneered and 
the Brazilian bank and the French are now doing, which is looking at the, the loan portfolios, the bank portfolios, the investments and stress testing them under nature scenarios. Um, what the Dutch found is actually very similar to what was found in Brazil and France, which is around 40 to 47 percent of the exposure of the banks was dependent on nature. No surprise. Uh, many estimates put 50 percent of the world's total economic output dependent on nature. Um, but I think once that starts happening, then actually the industry starts to sit up and take notice. We saw this with climate once. I think it was the Bank of England that st first started doing stress testing for climate. Once you start to see the central banks do it, then the banks start to do it themselves because they know that, that that stress test will have implications on, on them. So we do see more and more companies do this. Um, scenarios, of course, is going to be part of our methodology and that we have to do. We haven't done that yet, but it's an important part of the methodology so that people can actually look at, under certain scenarios, how do those risks from nature manifest themselves and, and how do they manage them more effectively? Um, in the local areas that they're operating. We, in our discussions with with many of the world's investors, they're obviously grappling with uh, investing in such a way that aligns to a net zero commitment um, from a from a climate perspective. In terms of either your members or other engagements that you have with investors, what are you <clears throat> hearing from them? Are you hearing concern about where do they get the data from? Are they waiting for you to deliver? version one of the framework and they'll pick it up from there a lot of different cases i mean um we've got for example uh, the french banks bnpp um axa the insurance um are, are very far along they've been very focused on this for many years and they've already got large data sets and people who are uh very skilled and, and forward looking um in this area um, so the banks are in different stages of, of this journey. Generally, um, I think compared to even June when I started on this, the conversation has picked up a huge amount. It picked up a lot at COP in Glasgow. Uh, we were very keen and focused that the financial community understood that we cannot just focus on climate. We have to look at nature and climate together. So I think there's a growing recognition that uh, this is happening and that this needs to be taken into account um, considered people on different parts of the journey. Um, certainly a uh, lot of support, as I said, 300 members of the TNFD from around the world, which is which is a great sign. A, a lot of um, um, demand to see the framework and understand where this is heading. A lot of groups like us um, are very focused on their specific parts of developing either the framework in risk management and opportunities that we are or the science-based targets or the specific targets like the CBD. So it's coming together. It's just not all there um, um, at the moment. I, I think, and this is one thing I've been saying to the financial institutions about what to do um, now, um, I think on the data side, having that location data map is becoming really important, understanding geography um, and the, the biomes, as we call them, and the ecosystem services and impacts and dependencies there. I'm also hiring the capabilities and skills. I mean, um, you know, what we are seeing is that there, there are a lot of people that understand biodiversity. There's obviously a lot of people that understand investing and banking and management of assets, portfolio management. There's very few people who really understand both. And, and actually, we've seen this in climate, that having that skill set in your organization is going to be a very important part of success going forward. And um, having the trading and the capabilities inside the organization is, is starting to become a priority. And we see many financial institutions really working on that now. Talk a lot about shifting the allocation of capital away from nature negative towards nature positive actions or outcomes. Can you explain what a nature positive action or outcome could look like? Yeah, um, I mean, um, you mentioned net zero and targeting net zero. A lot of firms now are saying, well, we, we want to, our aspiration is to be nature positive. Um, now, the broad definition of nature positive is, is actions and activities that leave the natural ecosystem in a more positive state than it was when you started um, and is also positive for the business activity together. So it's a combination of, of both that give you that nature positive outcome. And some of the examples um, that we've seen, um, drinks manufacturing companies, you know, increasing their efficiency on water usage. Um, one example I know where they've actually reduced the amount of water that they were consuming for production by 40% over four years, uh, which has had a substantial impact on the local environment. And, and in fact, they had challenges because in the areas they were working, 
uh, farmers were complaining about the lack of water because of the consumption they had, but also significant cost saving as well. And as we found with, with climate and carbon emissions, you know, often what you're actually doing is reducing waste. Carbon is a waste byproduct of many activities. Excess water usage is, is a waste product that you're consuming too much water. And therefore, by reducing that, you've actually reduced the amount of total cost that you have. So it's just one good example of, of, of a nature positive activity um, and that is there. Um, I mentioned offsetting and a lot of the nature positive activities around um, reforestation, protection of forests, um, is nature positive in the way that it's a positive contribution to the ecosystem. It's creating um, natural capabilities to absorb carbon. It's also now in impacting your carbon offset and therefore you're accounting on that. So that's another good example of a, a nature positive activity. Um, there are many others too around um, mangrove protection, replantation, um, seagrass and seagrass, which is a very important factor in when it comes to the sea and the health of the sea. So there's many, many more good examples of where you see nature positive actions coming together. I think um, what is missing at the moment is a real true definition in the, in the same way that net zero is quite well defined and we have science-based targets. There's still a lot more work to do to put specific targets around what does nature positive really mean in the, in the local area or the, the ecosystem that I'm operating in. Thanks, David. I just noticed the World Economic Forum uh, recent global risk report where they put the top three of 10 risks are all uh, very much nature related. I think the third one is around biodiversity loss and we've also got climate action failure and extreme weather. Whilst you have already a, a large membership within the organization, within TNFD, have you found that this is starting to focus people's minds a little bit more on the associated risks that corporations and financial institutions might be wearing and what would your message be for them? Um, yes it is and, and actually um, I'm a member of the World Economic Forum Nature Group and the Nature Champions and we're working very closely with them because they've got tremendous access to organizations um, across the world. They're really helping us on for example the case studies of what's nature negative but also nature positive and what could that look like. Um, you know, my advice for organizations, um, if, if you're an institution that is an investor or an asset owner, um, really understanding if the management teams on those companies understand the natural risks that they, they have, uh, both in terms of those dependencies that I talked about, but also the impacts that they might be having on the natural environment. Um, so if you're in food production, agriculture, you know, obviously the farming market has, has, is at the front line, if you like, of this, but it could be clothing manufacturer where you're using a lot of natural products and maybe producing a lot of waste um, and really understanding that. Um, I also think looking at the opportunity side, Tetra Pak, for example, has committed to 100% um, recyclable and renewable sourced um, packaging um, in, I think it's the next couple of years and has claimed to be generating um, several billion of uh, reduced cost and opportunity from, from doing that. I and mean, it's a good example of just, you know, looking at the packaging industry and now some of the opportunities to reduce waste, to stop pollutants and plastics and PET going into the environment um, could create an opportunity side as well. So I think from an investor side, it's really understanding if the companies that you're investing in, they understand this, this issue. Do they understand the full life cycle of their operations from all the way from the raw materials that they're sourcing to the products and the downstream activities that they're having? Um, and understanding if they've got an awareness of the risks and some of the mitigation factors that are behind them. What, what we are seeing is that um, those firms that are having a dramatic negative impact on the natural system are discovering quite quickly that they're having to correct and having to adjust for that. So there's some transition risks that they're going to have to go through. Um, people ask me, what's the next stranded asset? Um, if you think about coal um, in the climate debate, I think it's plastic. Um, I don't think it's the only one, but I think plastic and plastic production is going to become a stranded asset um, because people are quickly realizing the damage it does to environment. And, and therefore, firms will have to quickly look at how they reduce plastic from their their chain or how they ensure the plastic that they are using is is recyclable and used again. Thank you. I think one of the challenges I found sort of over the last couple of years in sustainability is is navigating that healthy tension between the focus on on revenues and numbers. We work in a bank, so clearly we're, we're working towards 
targets and budgets alongside the, the clear evidence now from a science from the science perspective that there is a degradation of our, our planet so it's navigating around that what do you see will be the the biggest barriers of adoption for tnft or the, or the biggest challenges that you and your colleagues will face uh, yeah i think those um challenges are, are, are well put um and having lived as you know my former role as a ceo of a very large global company and having to go through the climate um disclosures and risk management and um, myself um, there is definitely investment and cost and focus and work that you have to do to understand this. But but actually, once you start to get those skills on board and, and have a better understanding, and it does take some time, you realize this is less of a barrier than you think. But, but that said, um, I know for a fact that still only around 40% of the world's public companies are disclosing their carbon emissions. So there's still a lot of work to do on climate. Um, and now we're moving on to the world of, of nature as well. So I do think the biggest barrier is skills. I think skills and understanding. We've had a lot of great input from people about don't just explain the what of nature related risk and opportunities, but the how. Um, give us some case examples. Explain how we can do this. Give us a guidance of the type of approach that you do. Show us how some companies are using an asset register with location mapping. Um, to do this. We're doing a lot of work with the data companies. That's where I've come from. I spent 30 years in data and financial markets. We actually see a tremendous opportunity for them helping lead the way, not, not just with data, but with analytics and with tools uh, in ways of doing this. There's some incredible data sets now available around the world from um, the NGOs, um, systems like Encore that looks at um, ecosystem risk and areas from satellite data, from monitoring. And, and in fact, what you're learning, and I had this conversation with an oil company right this morning, was a lot of the companies themselves know more about the natural systems that they're operating in and the ecosystems than actually the, the local environment agencies. It's quite interesting. And not always true, but often true in some areas. And, and therefore, how do we harness that data set um, and those data, that data intelligence and use that in the decision making that we have to do um, to embrace this. I, I think my message to everyone is, is there is an advantage in being um, out in front of this. Um, I think what we've learned with climate that is if you leave transition too long, it becomes more expensive and the stranded asset cost is higher. Um, and a lot of the companies that might be complaining the most about um, climate transition and transition away from high carbon, um, frankly, have seen this coming for some time, but have failed to act. So their short termism, if you like, of kicking this can down the road has come up to um, catch them out. And um, I think that the more bolder the organizations are of seeing the future um, and where this is heading, the easier the transition will be and the, the more valuable the companies will be in the future if they get out ahead of this. David, we've been through a lot of the, the questions, so I thank you for your patience on those. Just from a personal point of view, what would you, in terms of your vision uh, and hope for the future, what, what would you see the TNFD to have accomplished, let's say, in, in five years from now? What would you hope that will have been be in place and what would you see as, as that impact uh, and the impact really around financial institutions like ourselves, but also the, the, the corporations who we work with very closely? Well, I'm a huge believer in the, the power and strength of financial markets for good. Um, and when they turn their attention and, and do things in the right way and assets are properly valued, um, it's an incredibly powerful movement where trillions of dollars can be shifted in the right direction. Um, my, my vision is that the investment approaches that we're making as firms around the world incorporate natural system dependencies, the ecosystem services and the impacts on nature so that we stop actually um, leveraging this for free and recognizing that, it, that it's not for free, but actually that there's also tremendous opportunity in return for investing in the right way. I, I think we're at a little bit where the, the climate and energy production industry was about five years ago, um, when alternative energy sources were quite nascent, quite small, they haven't yet scaled. Um, um, now look at where we are with alternative energy sources, with the amount of solar farms that have been invested in, the, the wind farms, both offshore and onshore, uh, the investment now going into hydrogen and, and other energy forms. I think with the natural biodiversity, we're, we're at that 
point they were five or six years ago, where these are still very early and very nascent, but they represent investment opportunities as well. So I do think that my vision and, and enthusiasm for the financial market is that we can adapt and shift to ensure that we're including natural system and natural biodiversity risk and opportunities, that we reprice the portfolios based on that. And we recognize that actually um, we can stop exploiting and, and damaging the natural system that we rely on and actually start to regenerate it um, ourselves. A, a lot of people ask me, you know, is this a just cause for good? Is this the natural system of the planet needing protecting? Um, and there's a lot of very interesting writing out there that the, the natural system will regenerate itself. The, the risk here is to human activity. Um, and I think that's been made very clear through the WEF and the other economic reports is that the natural system um, can regenerate, can work really well, is incredibly innovative. Our, our challenge is that we are using it at a pace that it faster than it can regenerate. And therefore, the risk is to the economic and food production and the systems that we rely on as humans. So it's really about ensuring we as a human system and a financial system um, are sustainable and resilient by leveraging those assets and protecting them in the right way. And that's where the financial market can play a really important role in doing so. David, I just want to take the opportunity to, to thank you for your time today. I uh, appreciate you have a very tight schedule. It's been a pleasure to have the opportunity to discuss some very important messages with you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mark, and, um, and good luck with the mission on the task force and incorporating natural risk into the system. Thank you.